Hey, everybody. I'm actually going to be foregoing the sponsors this week to uh, kind of give you a heads up on this episode. The quality is not the greatest, and for that, I do apologize. Um, this is actually a fault on my end. And uh, just to give you a heads up, I have not been with it mentally this week. Uh, I actually found out that my family had a very, very serious health scare. So that, unfortunately, has taken up quite a bit of my time and making sure that I'm there for my wife and making sure I'm there for my family to make sure everything's going on. With that said, uh, do not hold anything against the guys at Massive Awesome. Hopefully you don't hold anything against his, us here at Skirmish Supremacy. It's just uh, with everything that's been going on, the episode sound quality did not come out the greatest. And uh, if you want to know more about Massive Awesome, uh, check out the links on our webpage. They're going to have everything there. And I can guarantee you, Simon and John will be on the show at a later date. These guys are amazing, totally awesome guys. And I look forward to doing many more podcast episodes with them. So again, guys, I apologize for the sound. Thank you so much for listening. Enjoy the show. All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of Skimmer Supremacy. We are here today with John and Simon from Massive Awesome. How are you guys doing today? We are doing really well. Thank you very much for having us on the I am great. Cheers, guys. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, so just to give everybody a heads up, we have been uh, talking to these guys a little bit before we started this podcast, and uh, some of us are halfway into about three or four drinks, while others of us... <laughs> We don't see how this is going to turn out, but what the hell, we're going for it anyway. It's going to be fun, I think. The magic, the magic of the midnight recording. <laughs> so, just to give everybody out there a little bit of a taste, I'm sure everybody out there has been checking out on Kickstarter. Most skirmish games are not being done on Kickstarter. They have a Kickstarter going on right now for a game called Shattered Earth. So, it is a pseudo post apocalyptic, I'd say, real. Kind of real world scenario from what I've seen with uh, some magic and other dimensions thrown in. So, guys, why don't you tell us a little bit about it? Uh, and you know, if my description was wrong, please correct me and feel free to draw me any other part. The description is pretty spot on, to be honest. It's, um, yeah, we, we call it the, the post apocalyptic war game of uh, wondrous technology and existential horror. So, there's a few different things going on there. The key thing for us, really, is that this isn't your typical post-apocalyptic setting. Um, we wanted to move away from the... Like, post-apocalyptic games normally have one of two different settings. Either it's an radiated wasteland, a la Fallout, or it's a uh, you know, desert like Mad Max. Um, and that's really, that's really you know, the kind of the, the subtitle of, of most creative development in the post-apocalyptic genre. So we started looking at what would a real post-apocalyptic scenario look like you know, how would that pan out? And we actually started developing this game um, well, well over a year ago now. Uh, look at the, you know, the kind of the, the, the background of the world and before we even knew what sort of game it was going to be, really. And that's, that's kind of how it grew. We knew we wanted to create something that was, I think you touched on it in the description when you said it's got this realistic feel. Uh, we wanted to create something that felt authentic, uh, that felt like something tangible that felt like could exist theoretically. Uh, and that was the starting point, really. And then, of course, we added lots of other crazy stuff to it on top, and uh, and that's what that's that's what makes happy there, really. Because the, the the universe of the game contains basically the, the the kind of IP of, of our universe is you know the, the way that the the, the tectonic plates plates shift uh, incredibly slowly over time, but over the course of kind of hundreds of millions of years, the the continents completely change and, and, and the world looks different. Um, we've based uh, between around about 2025 and 2045, um, we've had the equivalent of 100 million years worth of change. So the the geography of the world has completely changed, which has created new continents, new super continents, and that's one of the main drivers for the factions of the game is their their new geographical location. Um, and then part of the reason that that's happened is we've 
got this uh, sort of way of a breach between the real world and the, the immaterial, uh, the world of dreams and nightmares, and we don't, well, the, the players in the game don't fully understand exactly how that's happened, but that one of the factions, four of the five factions available are human, and one is the deathless. They are immaterial, um, based on kind of myths from real human legend. And there, from that point, if you can imagine a world where we've had a hundred million years of the tectonic shift very quickly, and monsters have turned up, then everything else is as realistic as possible. Like, so we look at the politics of how people would deal with that and who would side with who and why they would. And because it's only set you know, slightly in our future, most of the weaponry is slightly ahead of what the weaponry is that we have today. But we haven't, you know, we're not set thousands of years into the future, so we don't have kind of, you know, warp drives and things like that. Right, yeah, I was kind of noticing that when I was looking through the Kickstarter. Um, a lot of the, the guns seem like they're based from anything that would be probably about, I don't know, 10 to 20 years from now. Even some of your mech designs, uh, very similar to things that I know that the military has been working with nowadays, but it's just kind of left that prototype phase and gone into more of like battle testing. Yeah, we did a bit of research into kind of the, the weaponry that is being looked at uh, in a kind of experimental phase and phased that in as well as. Uh, you know, sort of very sort of leading edge of what is around today, because although it is set, you know, the world is the world is broken, and then we've set the game about twenty, thirty years after that. So people aren't wandering around, you know, looking for food. You know, there is a semblance of normality. Cities have formed. You know, new countries and parliaments have formed. Um, so they have had time to look at weaponry, but they haven't been working on it solidly for kind of fifty years because they've had, you know, a lot of shit going on. Um, but there has been, you know, uh, you know, you know, in times of war and in times of strife, that's when scientific uh, experimentation gets more money from the government. So there has been a move onward, uh, but it's we're trying to keep it to a kind of realistic level. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's down to the authenticity. I think, from our point of view, good storytelling and good world building should have one foot in reality because I think people there's this um, I used to work in the work, I still do work in the, in the video games industry that's my I guess my day job if you like um, and one of the, the things from, that I brought across from the games industry is this idea of um, the rule of thirds which is where if you're going to create something new uh, you should always look at making a third of it exactly the same as something else a third of it better than something else so you take an existing idea or an existing design and improve upon it and then a third of it completely different. And the, the theory behind that is that if you give people too much difference, you give them too much unique, it actually puts people off as counterproductive. But by the same token, if you give people something that's too familiar to stuff that they've already seen before, they're just going to switch off because they've already got a game or they've already got, you know, artwork that looks like that. So you're looking to try and get people to feel like there is a connection with your universe, that there are things in it that they understand and can relate to. And then the big, bad, scary stuff is big, bad, and scary, and actually more effective because they've got a more accurate frame of reference. And that's, we, we keep coming back to that with our world building. It's become, it's been a very important thing for us. Yeah, okay, cool. So, I've been kind of taking through the, the uh, Kickstarter page a little bit. Um, and how many factions do you guys have? We have five factions, um, and as John was saying before, this, four of them are human factions, uh, and then the fifth one is the, the, are these creatures from the interior. And these are the factions that we've uh, we've revealed so far. If you like, these are in the the, the, the case after it's called Shattered Earth Emergence, and Emergence is kind of the first chapter, if you like. Um, and all of these factions are um, from the northern hemisphere, and there are there are specific reasons for that, which we'll I, I suppose we can get into a little bit later. Um, but essentially, the four human factions are, you know, as John was alluding to, we extrapolated the sort of geopolitical climate and looked at where where the continents would move to, where the, the new borders would be drawn, and therefore what peoples might collaborate together and what new governments and and, and factions would form out of that. Um, so we have uh, the United Nations of Mankind, who are uh, essentially most of North America. And also most of, uh, sort of continental Russia, 
Um, because, the, again, because of the movement of the tectonic plates, those two continents are actually kind of colliding around the point of, uh, into the Andrena Islands. Um, and so there was a, and we kind of, we talked a little bit more about it in the backstory, but there are political reasons why these two factions are aligned, but there's also geographical reasons and economic reasons why they're aligned. Um, there's also the, what was the European Socialist Galactic, which is obviously the majority of Europe, uh, they have now become the humanist rebel. Um, they were at once kind of tied into the UN, um, but kind of there was a political disagreement, if you like, about the way forward, and so they, they distanced themselves and become now an out and out rebellion. Um, the other two, uh, human factions, we have the, uh, Children of the One True God, which came about from a, a discussion John and I were having about what would happen to religion after the apocalypse, because Essentially, there's, there's not really any holy book that deals with that situation because, well, nobody's meant to survive it. And how there are people now across so that on the earth that have survived it. So, for a person of faith, what does this mean? And I think rather fortuitously for us, we discovered that the Arabic faith itself would actually separate and become an island given a huge sequence of cataclysmic events, which gave us a really great sort of focal point for this faction. And actually, the Arabic faith, you've got Jerusalem sat right at the tip of it, the tip of it. So again, that's the reality kind of bleeding into the, the fiction, if you like, um, and driving our, our, our storytelling. Um, and then the fourth human faction, perhaps the, the strangest by far, they're, they're known as the Cult of the Dragon. And they are, they formed from uh, most of uh, what was East Asia, um, a lot of the East Asian islands, uh, it became the, uh, an, an archipelago essentially, and, and formed the, the, the um, Pacific archipelago. And they've been usurped by this, this cult, essentially, uh, built around this enigmatic man called Lee Kyung Min, uh, who's a, a former Korean pop star entertainer turned cult leader. Um, so, he, obviously, we've got quite a lot of variety in, uh, in those factions to begin with, and then we throw in the Deathless, who are this very strange esoteric faction from the interior. And hopefully, we've got a little bit of something there for everybody, regardless of you know, what your preferences are in Wargaming. Yeah, absolutely. So, one of the things I noticed as I was kind of paging through this a little bit, so, your Cult of the Dragon, I found to be a little bit unique, because it looks like uh, the, the cult leader, forgive me if I forget his name, um, he is actually in a partnership with uh, the Norse Dragon Warmer. Yeah. So, ba- so, basically, all of the, uh, all of the kind of the death and sort of the immateria, um, characters. So we've got maybe three or four who are in the game at the moment, and we've written the next half a dozen, and obviously it, it could go off on ad infinitum, but they're all based on actual figures. So Jormungandr was a, a kind of a, I think he was the son of Loki, he was, uh, and he's a, he's a, he's a god who is, was celebrated in, in the Nordic area. And then we, we talk about other, different gods and monsters from human myth and human legend. And part of the game is now we've got these breaches between the real world and the immateria, they're, you know, we're bleeding into their world and they're bleeding into our world. And, you know, did we create them by dreaming about them or did we always dream about them and worship them because they were always there is one of the questions that we want to sort of have the game as asked. And in our game, all of the, the, the breaches have uh, immaterial kind of gods and monsters coming into our world, except the one human who has ever gone into the immaterial and survived and come back was Lee Kyung Min. And there's a long piece of fiction on the, um, on, I think, one of the updates that anyone, anyone can go and read a couple thousand words where we try to show off some, you know, what would be in the rule book, which explains, you know, what happened to him. But effectively, he, you know, he, looked around for all these different types of things to worship. He was very interested in the, the immaterial, very interested in the arcane, and uh, he felt drawn to this part of the world. And hence, because he ended up in uh, sort of near to Sweden, when he went through this breach, that's why he found Jormungandr. And without dragging the story on too long, Jormungandr has used him to manifest himself in the real world, and he has used Jormungandr to get powers way above the normal human, and there is a kind of uneasy alliance between the two. So on the tabletop, you might play him as human, or you might play him as demon. Or if you have both models and choose to, those are 
stat card which changes and depending on dice rolls and what happens on any given turn, he may flip from one to the other because he is effectively both. Nice. So he's in a way a kind of a morph character. You could start him off as the mm. form and then halfway through it you could be like, you know what, to heck this, this isn't working, I'm gonna go into my I guess uh, demigod form. Uh, I guess you don't have full control over the change. You can try and influence it by the amount of by, by what is happening in that given scenario, but you, to fully reflect um the relationship between the two characters, you don't get to say, oh, this turn I want to be Yorming and or this turn I want to be Kyongmin. You can try and influence it. And that kind of leads into the way that we try to create the whole game in that, you know, we've written the rules and we've written the backstory and we've created the art so it all balances with each other. So one of us will come in with an idea and then if it just fits, the art and the story will, will mold around the rules to make sure it fits. But if the art kind of doesn't quite fit, but we really like the art, we might then change the story, or we might even in some cases change the rules to reflect that, because we want all three sections, like the way the game plays, the way the game looks, um, uh, to, 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 to balance each other, you know? Yes, yeah, there's actually something I want just briefly want to pick up on with that. There's the leak on the character itself, the actual military we created, was the first military we made. The first one we had sculpted, and the first one we had prototype. And he's a, he's he designed as a limited edition miniature, essentially, and he, he is in fact a limited edition miniature. But rather than, one of the things we wanted to try and do, again, diving back into what John was just saying, rather than have these as just, uh, collector's pieces, you know, and we, we believe our miniatures are, you know, high quality and good enough to just be bought as pieces to paint by the people that are interested in that sort of thing, um, but, but we didn't want it to stop there. So we, you know, as John said, if you, have the Lee Kong in miniature, even though it's kind of special edition and limited edition. There are rules for in the game, and there is also that additional stat card that also changes the way you own them plays as well, they interact. So there's a, you know, there's a reason to, to, to own him, and there's a reason to have him above and beyond just the beautiful miniature itself, really. Um, and that was kind of, again, that's part of our philosophy of making everything connect, and we kind of join the dots, if you like. Okay. Okay, cool. So I'm going to, Ask this as a devil's advocate question because I know that there's going to be people out there hearing that they're going to wonder if I can't get my hands on a limited edition figure, can I still use the standard edition Lee Kyung Min and have him turn into the Yormagat? Well, there's there's two sets of profile cards basically. Um, so essentially, in the uh, the kind of I suppose what we can do, we can get a little, I guess a little bit of the call of the dragon here. So as, as John said, you know, these are Meteor Men that bound themselves to this Norse god. So there are two other um, main characters within the Cult of the Dragon that we haven't revealed yet. They're not part of the Wave 1 releases, they're the later releases. But both of those are also based on uh, gods from, um, from the sort of myth and folklore, if you like. And the, the, there is this kind of triumvirate, if you like. So the Cult of the Dragon is essentially based on the, the theory of chaos count. The, the sort of the, the struggle, the motif, the struggle against chaos. And, um, you know, Yorn Gang is obviously one of the most sort of prevalent gods, but you also have things like, um, Leviathan or Tiamat. So anytime there's a certain god or a chaotic god, it's, you know, it's, it's prevalent throughout all, all sort of folklore. And so those are the main characters, if you like, in the Cult of the Dragon, uh, fashion, at least on the tabletop. But Lee Kong Min himself is, is such an important character within the storyline. And given his backstory, we wanted to at least produce something on the tabletop, uh, that represented him. So he's, he's kind of, he's not a, uh, a thing that we need to get out Um, but we still want to at least give him reference as well, as I said, we'll just use him as a miniature. And actually, that slightly sort of nature of him, him either staying on the tabletop table or him, him looking at your guy, guy is, isn't necessarily more <laughs> of a balance than it is there, really, but, uh, uh, the, the kind, kind of, kind of theme, theme and narrative. So, so I think, think that, that, that's, that's really, really kind of, kind of the next So, so I think, I think, I think it's, it's, an, it's an, an anapo bonus as well rather than an absolute necessity. You see what I mean? Yeah, because I, I mean, I can tell you this just from years and years and years ago. A lot of people they care so much about game balance nowadays that uh, when they hear limited edition figure that does this cool stuff, but they can't get a hold of them without being a special thing. Yeah, yeah. It's not like some 
immediately broken game mechanic or something like that is always good for people to hear. It's like, okay, so if I get this figure, who might do this slightly differently to pass that? The game plays the same. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And then, and then, and then it's, it's kind of like, like, um, I, I have not quite the same, but I don't know whether you guys have any other moveset in my Magic Gathering that just brought a whole bunch of fun on the game. And actually, I've played, uh, it's based on, it's kind of like the devil will be like, and a lot of his will be like, full rules of different rules of the rest of the characters in the game. So it's, it's about violence and something unique, and you do need to be able to do it, but it isn't, you know, you're a fantastic player, or you want one mobile battle, or you've got to have that out. Which is the reason why we do the normal game, and then, the more powerful one is available to start set, it will always be available. I guess we haven't fully decided exactly what one entity means, whether it means we're going to go to Zenith or maybe available for us or not retail, but it's still going to be available to start set. Yeah, it's going to be available to start set. Yeah, it's going to be available to start set. Yeah, it's going to be available to start set. Yeah, it's going to be available to start set. Yeah, it's going to be available to start set. Yeah, it's going to be available to start set. Yeah, it's going to be available to start set. Yeah, it's going to be available to start set. Yeah, it's going to be available to start set. Okay, that makes yeah, sense. Yeah. Cool. So, you guys have talked a little bit about the different factions, and you, you, you touched a couple times upon, like, rules and mechanics. Why don't you uh, let us, tell us, uh, how does the game play? What are the mechanics for playing Shattered Earth? Well, Shattered's kind of, I, I guess, unique in service games, in a sense that it's... Uh, so, so we set out with two goals in mind when we started creating the rule set for this. One was that it had to be fun and accessible to play, in that the rules felt that you didn't have to, you could play the game from the sat part essentially, you didn't have to keep consulting all book. You know, there's no look at tables in the game, there's no complicated mathematics, it's, you know, everything works on the tabletop, and, and actually, you know, other than the first 15 minutes of playing the game where you're actually getting your head around things, after that you are literally just going to play the game from the sat part. You can never be logical, everything makes sense. sense. The game uses uh, people work based system, system so that, that um, you know, you, 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 when you, you see, see one rule written in one place, place, it means the same as it is when it's written somewhere else. Like, there's no unique, um, you know, very specific rules for every single miniature. Of course, the miniatures have their own special rules, but there's a whole raft of general rules that everybody has access to. Um, so again, you know, if you're familiar with things like, uh, like War Machine Course, for example, that uses a similar keyword based system, um, you know, you, you, you'll get this right off the bat. So that was, that was, that was one of the things that we wanted to address. The other side of it was that we wanted to have a enough depth to the game that people felt that they could explore kind of tactically, um, you know, the, the depth of the system, if you like, so that there are multiple options available to you. Um, a bit like... And I would say it isn't quite as combo heavy as something like War Machine, but there is opportunity for you to set things up and see the payoff, you know, one or two turns down the line. Um, and actually you use a, a thermal activation, so you're not, it's not an ideal ego system. There's always that, you know, I have the I have something, then you go ahead and activate something that is back to me. So play passing back and forth quite regularly. So there's no just kind of sitting on your hands or sort of your thumbs or, you know, reading your phone or whatever. Um, that, that you, you constantly feel like you're involved in the action. So, they're, they're the two kind of key drivers for how the rule set. Um, I guess from a system point of view, the thing most people probably might not be used to, unless they play a lot of historical games, certainly a lot of naval games at least, is uh, the game of dice books. And, which is, which is quite different to, I don't think there are any of the skirts games that use dice books. Um, and this was me, this was my game type hat on, my, my kind of, my background in the game industry really. So looking at just the pure maps behind, the system when I first started developing it. Um, and it's, it's D10 based, so it's base 10 system, it's massively straightforward, and um, it uses a fixed target number. So, um, you know, you don't have to perform any maths during the game itself. All you're ever going to do for any modifiers is either add dice to or subtract dice from your pool. That's it. So, if you get a plus two bonus, you add two dice to your pool. If you get a minus three modifier, you can take three dice away. That's it. So that target number always stays the same. Um, it's, I, if anybody's played Shadow on the RPG, it's, it's a very similar system to that, in a sense that you're just looking for hits on your dice. Um, so it's, it's, you know, you get to roll a nice, healthy, handful of dice, but most of our, uh, 
and it's just even kind of basic sort of truth because you're like you're rolling 10 dice most of the time. And uh, 10 d 10 is, is a very satisfying way to dice to roll. Um, some of the big fruits. Yeah, it is, it's definitely. And I think when we first released really the alpha rules, we had a few people that were quite surprised by that. Because I think people were expecting to let four or five dice really. But no, I mean, this is a dice ball game based game, so you know, you want, you want nice healthy pools. And also, the math starts out really nicely. Like, your average pool size is 10, and it's a D10 based game. There's a really nice predictable curve that you can work with. So, you know, not only is it fun to play in from an aesthetic point of view, because, you know, everybody likes calling it healthy dice, right? Um, you know, the maths work really well as well. So, yeah, it's, it's a, it's one of those games that, that when, when it clicks with you, there is a lot of freedom, and there is a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of opportunity for you as a player to explore the rules. So, you should never feel restricted in the game. If there's something you want to do, chances are there is a rule that supports you doing that. And it's a pretty simple rule. Um, so yeah, it's a, I would urge people, you know, the alpha rules are available on our Kickstarter page. So, by all means, grab them. Um, we've really, we've now released, as of today, we've released all of the Wave 1 faction profiles. So every miniature that's available on the Kickstarter has the alpha rules available to download. Um, the rules will forever be free. They will always be available to download on our website even when we, we are producing physical rule books. Um, we, we, you know, we want to keep that low barrier to entry and, and really kind of grow a community around this game. So by all means, like, grab them, join our Facebook playtesting group and, and please give us your feedback. Nice, nice. Yeah, I'm so glad to hear that, uh, especially when our smaller companies are doing that, I, I've noticed that uh, about the different things I've done in the industry, that uh, there's a lot of times that the smaller companies are almost afraid of people know the rules for free, which I think is sometimes a detriment. Um, you know, there's a lot of times to where they, they feel that the people are paying for the rules, and a lot of times that's that's almost backwards from what they're doing, unless they're a game similar like Frostgrave, where you know, in Frostgrave you have more of that you have, you're paying for the rules. So yeah. You know, especially since you guys have beautiful miniatures, and you ultimately the business is going to be coming from miniatures. Having the rules out there for free, not that big of a deal, which is great. Yeah, we're really, we're we're really trying to go for this. Um, I mean, the the ultimate aim of the game is that there are you know there are three types of gamers. There are people that love fluff, that love to get you know knee deep in the black library and read you know fifty novels about you know all this heresy and stuff. And then there are guys that love that kind of high end really detailed sort of resin miniatures or that the, the, are in the game for the modelling and the painting and then there are guys that want to play the game aren't too fussed about the other areas and just want a nice streamlined game that plays well and is interesting has lots of tactical options and we realise you know we could concentrate on one or two and then the other slide and, and it would be less work and cost less money to develop and we you know we got to an age where we thought you know if we're going to do it we really maybe biting off more than we can chew at one end, but we wanted to do all three. So we're trying to appeal to, you know, if, if people want to buy miniatures just to paint and think these are really beautiful miniatures, you know, they should look at the minis because it's, and things like your and I think I was, and, you know, we shouldn't say so ourselves, but I, I think it's as good as anything I've seen at least in a long time. And then, you know, we've also got a massive amount of backstory, you know, from a kind of a political level, a, a, a macro world level, down to a micro level of some of the characters, and um, we can, uh, you you can really get involved in the in the in the universe of the game. Whether you want to do it from a kind of a, a what country versus country basis, or a, you know, come with a kind of skirmish character versus character, you know, we've got you covered there, and we've got lots of fiction coming. And then the actual rules of the game. You know, Sai talks about it. You know, he's been in games now for fifteen years, so. It's, uh, the way that we do that is basically I'm less of a tabletop or more of a kind of card game or board game. So we're making it as crunchy as, as possible that I can still play this game. So, uh, you know, we're going for all three and maybe, maybe we're aiming, maybe we're aiming higher though, but we want to, we want to appeal to all three of those types of games. And because I, you know, it's Simon and myself fit into those sides, the rules and a minis guy. I'm a kind of backstory and a minis guy. Um, we want a game that we both want to play. Nice, nice. So you kind of met in the middle on that that came time with the game itself. Yeah, yeah. It takes more time to do. It takes more money to do. But you know, we figure we may only get the chance to do this once with the amount of money we invested into it. So we don't really 
we don't really want to compromise on anything. You know, we keep looking at, you know, we, we could go with this sculpture or this sculpture or this cast or this cast or this artist. And every time we sort of go, think, well, it's probably worth the extra money, isn't it? And we always feel it has been worth the extra money. Um, or, you know, the extra effort, the extra time, but neither of us wanted to put all this time and effort in and, you know, save a little bit of time and effort. I think it wasn't quite as good as we could have made it. We'd rather just really nail it for, you know, for a few years and see where it takes us. Yeah, definitely. I mean, this is, this is a, this is a long term proposition for us. You know, this isn't a, um, it's not a one off. Kickstarter, where we're going to release a bunch of stuff and then you never get hear from us again. And that's something that really, obviously, tragic happens to us. But um, I'm not going to that. So, that's, you know, so, you know, the, the aim for us is to keep growing this game. Like, it, it, it may be, you know, slow and steady to begin with while we ramp up momentum because both myself and John have, you know, we have full time jobs. The game doesn't pay our salaries yet. In fact, it's barely going to pay back. It, it, well, it, I mean, the, the truth is, it will not pay back our initial investment. Yeah, that's. And we, we are comfortable with that. We knew that that was going to be the case. But that's, that's kind of the commitment, basically, from us that we are here for the long haul. We do want to make a successful business, but we're not going to cut corners. And we're not going to compromise to get there. We're going to do things the right way because it's standard. It stood us in good stead over the last 12 months. It stood us in good stead when we funded in the first few days of hitting Kickstarter from a completely new company that nobody had heard of until a few weeks before it, for the most part. So, you know, all of this is, is kind of proven to us that we are on the right path. And so we need to stay true to that path and we need to stay true to our initial goals. And hopefully that will see us right. And we, we've been lucky in that, you know, we've known each other 25 years and we've talked about working together a long time. We've been part of the same, you know, role playing group, gaming group for all that time. And having come to it, you know, both of us pushing for you now, we've got, you know, established careers. We we ha we are in a position where we are kind of able to financially you know do this and do it properly, which you know maybe if we'd done it a couple of years years ago we would have been desperate to take as much profit out of Kickstarter as soon as possible. Uh, now you know we can in some ways afford to see this play out, see the game grow organically over you know two, three, four years uh without you know without needing to take any money out of the company. Like everything we get at Kingstarter goes straight into sculpt and arts for the new figures. And it goes straight into the production of the rule book, like we're not making a penny out of it. Gotcha. So without like spoiling too much, what do you guys have planned for the future? You guys have been talking a lot about past Kickstarter, which is great. I mean any miniatures game author is gonna want to know that's awesome, what's next? So are you able to talk about that a little bit and kind of let Everybody know what you have play, be it um, you know store any, any type of like store deals, anything along those lines, things that you might tweak a little bit from the Kickstarter going to make it into the company. Yeah, absolutely. That was one of the first things I think we realised when we went to Kickstarter. And despite all the preparation that we've done, we hadn't quite realised how reticent some people were to invest in high quality resin miniatures. Um, simply because John and I are never hesitant to invest in high quality resin miniatures. Uh, that's I'm not happy with this about you. Yeah, that's really, it's the detriment of our bank balances. Um, but, you know, not everybody's like that. And I think the, the good thing from us at this time, despite the fact that we have, a, I mean, we have an absolutely awesome community that, like, we, I have been utterly blown away, or both of us have been blown away by the commitment from the community, just the support that they've shown us. Um, and really the, the kind of boldness to commit to two guys that, you know, this is, this is the first time we've done anything like this. We may be experienced in other industries, but we, we know we're not. You know, we're not a couple of, you know, a bunch of kids that are trying to, you know, do this with our pocket money. We, you know, we do think we know what we're doing. But to have these people kind of invest in us uh, has been really humbling. Um, but by the same token, I think we realise that there are, for every backer that we get that wants the high quality resin, there's probably four or five that would be much happier, be much happier with a, a sort of slightly cheaper, you know, metal product that we like. So, certainly one of the things, the things that we're going to look at for, um, an, an eventual retail release is to move the range into metal. But again, like everything that we've done so far, we're not going to rush it. Um, it would be easy for us, I think, to get some prototypes done, uh, during the Kickstarter itself. Um, in fact, we actually talked about it. I, I, I've got some contacts with the sort of casting industry that I was chatting to to see if we could get some, some metal prototypes made. But it ultimately decided 
and what we did want to do was that we didn't want to So the guys that are playing the game are able to boost their forces with additional characters with additional rules, and then eventually next year introduce another faction or another faction after that. Talk about other parts of the world that we haven't really talked about, um, and you know let them let the game grow, and we will fill the game up as it grows rather than try and push out. You know because we were talking about some companies before we started recording about where things have gone wrong. I mean, one why everywhere some companies have uh, not been able to keep up is they've got you know 30 playable factions with kind of 100 characters each and they, they just can't keep up and um, we don't really want to make that mistake especially being a smart company i mean you guys it's two guys so yeah. with that like, doing anything more than what you're doing now probably it would very good ways that in a way would be kind of it's a good thing but at the same time because it would be enough to in most cases, keep you guys completely on. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. As you had about last week, you know, we're just on the 
that that's at the end of the day, you know, you could companies can have a bit of a delay or maybe the detail on one of the models looks a bit off. I mean, not in our case, luckily yet. Um, so there are all sorts of little problems that companies can have, or they maybe they don't communicate enough. But the thing that will kill people is if they don't deliver and they don't tell people why. And if you deliver your product on time and it is as it said on the tip, you know that that's the ultimate. That's what we'll be judged on. And we want to bite off as much as we can chew, so that when we say we will deliver the product over, they get it, and it's exactly as they as they saw the photos. Uh, and if we, you know, as you said, if we try and deliver way too much, we'll probably we might end up getting delayed, or there might be other problems down the line. So I think by the end of this year, if we've had a successful Kickstarter, we've fulfilled every pledge. The guys like what they've got; that they're playing it, they're enjoying the game. That will lead to success. Like we're not planning for how to expand. We're planning for how to create a game that people like playing, they like the minis, they like the story, and they want more of it. And because they want more, we produce more. And, you know, the demand grows as the game grows rather than one outstripping the other. Right, which is a good way to look at it. I mean, the, the biggest thing that I try to promote the most on this podcast is the fact that there's so many guys out there that are passionate about their games, and that is enough to get them moving forward. That's enough to keep them even if they never really break into it doing it full time, doing it, you know, it's like their, it's like their main source of income. The fact that they even have a handful of people that are extremely passionate about it is enough to keep them going. So, yeah. I see where you're coming from with that. You want to make sure that you are putting out a quality product and people that already have it want to keep it going, which is really good. Yeah. Well, we, I, I talked to, um, I uh, speak to a couple of the guys at um, GCT Studios, the guys at Google Shido. And like all of all of those guys, I mean, they're a prime example. All of those guys have full time jobs, yet they continually put out great product. They grow the game, like it didn't it doesn't just disappear after the first few releases. You know, there's constant new ways of miniatures, new rules. You know, they put out a board game not that long ago, and for them, it, it kind of it's a combination. Of it scratches that itch. It gives you a creative outlet to kind of put your, your mad thoughts like onto the tabletop. But it also means that they're committed to, to supporting and growing that game, even though they all work full time. Um, and, you know, don't get me wrong, but myself and John, from our point of view, we would like this to be a full time concern. Um, you know, as well, as with our art, it, I should, it would be remiss of me, actually, if I don't mention our art, though, because the, the, the main, actually, too, there's a lot more than two of us, technically. Yeah, one of the guys that stood with us right from the beginning is a guy called, uh, Ivo Bielinski, who, um, he, you, you may know from the time that, um, Dark, working on Dark Age, responsible for the core faction in Dark Age. Um, and he's done a, a huge amount of concept art for us. He's responsible for a lot of our graphic design and our kind of creative output as well. So, um, you know, and, and add to that, the, the army of concept artists and scholars that we've got. That's not an army. I don't know. Let's, let's say a small skirmish force. Skirmish. Um, yeah. A small skirmish force of artists, concept. Uh, you know, concept like sculptors, casters, the approach and partners, everybody else. So there is, there's more going on behind the scenes than just myself, uh, John. Um, and that's really, you know, from what, so I guess dialing back into what John was saying before, the reason why we feel, we, we hope we are going to be able to deliver on this, we're confident we can deliver on is because we partnered with really experienced people. Yeah? The people that know exactly what they're doing and have the same philosophy as us and the same outlook as us, and we can just, pull together and create a great product. Um, there's no kind of second guessing each other. There's no, you know, ex- having to explain things two, three times. Like you just, everybody is so bought into this universe and this game that we're creating now that things just happen and things get done. Um, and that, you know, for myself and John, from our point of view, we're, you know, we're putting our money up for this. Actually now, you know, a few hundred back and also put their money up for it as well. There, there is that, there should be that confidence there because you know, we're, we're dealing with people that, you know, live and breathe this stuff as much as we do. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that's a, that's a great thing, too. So, you know, I, I think one of the other things that we talked about as well, just to kind of get a little bit hands up, is the fact that you guys didn't just approach us as a team of two. You, you went into this with a plan to expand. So, it, so as far as that goes, the, the freelance artists you brought on, the freelance companies you brought on, you really reached for something a little bit more than just I'm gonna sculpt this myself in my face. You went out of your way to find like world class sculptors, world class artists that have worked on different projects in order to help bring your vision to life, which is a good thing. 
That's yeah, for sure, and that that's why we had to invest so much of our own time and, and money up front. Really, you know, we could have, we didn't have to do that, but we wanted to. And as John said, you know, right at the beginning, if we're only going to get one shot of this, and we might only get one shot of this, why not make it the best that it can be? So I'm, you know, I'm pretty. Like, but, I'm pretty. It's the same reason why all four of us are often in trouble with our wives and many of our listeners are in trouble with their other halves because, you you know, you could proxy that figure or you could buy the special resin extra thing to make it just right or you could use the Games Workshop figure for your 30k army or you could get a Forge World special edition. Like, you often find yourself spending a bit more to make it just so and just right and we found ourselves, you know, we, we kind of, we, we had an original budget and we, we're not blown through it, but we've hugely exceeded it because whenever it came to a, a kind of compromise point, they were like, well, we can stay within budget or we could just push the boat out and get this guy who's got this great experience and look at what he can do and look at what this person can do. We've always thought, well, you know, in for a penny, in for a pound, let's put a bit more in and, and go for the best. Um, but it means, I mean, as we said before, you know, we're, look, we're in a position where we are, you know, we're not financially dependent on the success of this. I mean, we can't afford to throw, you know, tens of thousands of dollars down the pan, but we are able to, when we have a choice between the better or the, the almost as good, we, we are able to go for the better. And, you know, not just the quality of the sculpts and the art is what speaks for the people we work with, but it makes the whole process easier as well. When you're working with really experienced people, you learn from them, as well as getting a good product in the end. You, as Sai said, you don't have to explain things to people because they know how to work, they know what you need, it goes quicker, it goes more smoothly. The whole thing's been like, I mean, just a pleasure working with these absolute industry legends, you know, these guys that have produced such amazing work for other companies. Um, just to just to work with them, you know, nothing comes from this. It's just been, it's been an amazing, you know, uh, ride, you know, doing this. Yeah, you're you're working with guys that you want to look up to. In a way, you're paying a premium for safety, pay, which I told you. Yeah, exactly that, exactly that. And to get some amazing stuff as well. That's that's, that's not <laughs> that's not being around the rubbish. <laughs> I know we do definitely sound quite on our own backsides, it has to be said, but if, if anyone is listening and, and thinks, who, who the hell are these guys, go and look at the Yorn and Gamba sculpts and then admit that, you know, we're agreeing. That sounded really past the middle, like, it's a bit better in your head than it did, like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like that, that is better in, our, in my head. But go look at the Yorn and Gamba sculpts, it's, it's good. We should, we should point out this one. This is, that is entirely down to Evo and Cogsadar and Seth's incredible sculpting. Um, like nothing, nothing to do with John and I. I mean, we came up with the idea. We told the amazing artists what to do and then they, they did it. There's yeah, a and they were amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so you didn't have to go back like numerous times saying, oh, we need to fix this. Oh, we need to fix They pretty much just came up with something and went, holy shit, that's exactly what I we had we had a re- we've had a really good process with, with most of our guys. We have Slack channel, so you know, Cy and I uh, with the with the artist and sculptor that which is usually four of us will um will come up with an artist brief. So Cy and I will chat, I'll write a, a kind of a one pager, which is more than you really need, but we figure we can use this later on as well. So it'll have a bit of history about the character, um, it'll explain physically what we are envisaging and also you know, uh, how old they are, where they're from, what side they're on, and what they're, you know, a few things about their character. Because we figured, you know, if we were an artist, we'd want to know about it. We wouldn't just want someone to say, make him six foot three, big arms and a gun, you know. We're like, this is where he's come from, this is what drives it. So every character we've done, we created that. We gave it to the artist, and, and in most cases, they came back with, you know, half the sketches. We picked a couple, like, you know, the, the arms from this guy, the head from this guy put them together, change the, the angles and stuff. And then we have a few iterations until all of us would agree. And we wouldn't be saying, you must do this. You know, the artist in many cases would come up with ideas that we haven't come up with. And then we'll, as we said before, we might change the rules or the background story to fit in with a really great artistic idea or vice versa. Like all three would feed up each other. Um, and once we have that final kind of concept we all agree on, they will kind of turn that into a, a piece of key art. And then we'd start the process again with the sculptor. 
uh, it would you know take that key piece of art, all the information and the, the conversation we had, and then you know we'll talk about the positioning, you know exactly what can change, what needs bulking out because you know it won't sculpt well. And this is what you, when you pay for good sculptors like Seth, you know he'll look at the art, say that's great, but those fingers won't mould in, in resin, you know they'll snap. And that's, you know, if you hire some sort of cheap kid straight out of art college, you won't know that. They'll sculpt something that will then break when you cast it. Um, so, you know, or everyone involved deserves equal uh, praise. Uh, well, I said the artists and sculptors deserve more than us because they did, you know, hard work. But it really <laughs> was, you know, it really, for me, because, you know, I've worked in IT management, project management for 15 years, so I'm, I'm not used to the artistic process. And... It, it was way more collaborative than I expected, and that is how I want to work going forward. Everyone I want to work with, I want them to cover experience and give us their ideas, take our ideas, uh, back them backwards and forwards, and all feel that we're all invested in it, rather than just, here's our concept, do what we say. Yeah, well, sometimes that's, uh, that's the best way to work, especially, uh, you, know, you guys both still have your full-time day jobs, you can't devote 100% of your time to shit. So I told you, yeah. you want to make sure you have the team in place that's going to be able to go out of their way to assess doing exactly what you're doing. So that's it. I mean, that's the other person. Oh, sorry, Tony, but I'm just going to say that how you know, everybody's kind of on the same path, really. And, and the people, you know, the core team has been there really since the beginning. This is this is our baby, right? This is the thing that we've created together. And we all want to see it see it succeed, we all want to see it grow, and despite the fact that we all have day jobs, this is, it's that little bit of kind of relief at the end of the day where you get to go and do, you know, something something different, something where you can put the ideas in your head directly into practice, and so, you know, you've got, you know, you yourself might have a brief to work to in your day job, but now what well, we're creating briefs, you know, we're, 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 I wouldn't say we're making this up as we go along, but it's that kind of free form organic process. And that is the driver. That's the thing that makes you go the extra mile. Um, because if, if you don't love it, then you're never going to succeed. But you have to love it. Yeah, mm. absolutely. I mean, anytime you're talking about a game, any type of game, doesn't matter if it's board game or card game, especially with a miniatures game, like, it, it, it's, it's always going to be a Just the fact that there's an investment, you know, from the player's side. It's not just a matter of, I went out and bought the box. They're also investing their time to paint it. With their time to go to the store and play, their time to make campaigns. So there's, there's so much that's involved in that. If you, it's just, what are you doing? Yeah. And that goes back to what we were talking about before. You know, this is, it's your hobby time. And, you know, we, all, all four of us, you know, are hugely invested in this hobby, have been for a long time. So what would we invest in? What would, what would be worth our dollars? And, you know, that was how John and I approached this game. What, what would actually be worth our dollars? What would we want to see on the tabletop? And we, we figured it because, because we kind of spent, we spent at the premium end of the market, unfortunately. Um, and certainly unfortunately for our partners. Um, you know, we, we, we both put a pretty high quality threshold. And so we wanted to, to make the same thing for our own game. Yeah. I mean, I mean it, there are things that are universal. We've, we've covered the fact that, you know, Cy and I kind of more of the, spend a bit extra for the resin and, and we completely respect the guys that are happy to just, you know, push figures around the, uh, the tabletop. Or even, you know, talking about Infinity, Infinity figures are amazing. I mean, they're metal, but they're as good as most resin out there. Um, and, we, you know, we've learned that not everyone is like us. Some people have different value propositions for different materials, but then there are things that are universal. Everybody likes good communication on Kickstarter. You know, so we've tried to make sure that we've been open and honest. When we've made mistakes, we've, we've publicly said, you know what, we've made a mistake, we've changed it now. Uh, when we've done something we think has gone right, we've said it. Um, it's those kind of universal things, you know, we, we backed a lot of Kickstarters between us. And we know the things that we, we really appreciate from Kickstarter, and so we know the things that piss us off. And we've tried to avoid the latter and do as much as possible with the former. And where we get things wrong or we slightly misjudge stuff, you know, we hold our hands up, say, you know, we're learning, and uh, we'll, we'll try and do it right. Right. So that's a good lesson for anybody out there that's thinking about uh, getting started to manage your game this year. Do more communication with the community. Do less to piss them off. 
It's yes, it's it's that simple. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 it really is that simple. It's, it, I mean, that, sounds, that sounds jokingly simple, but how many times have you waited kind of a week or two weeks for for feedback from a company where something's gone wrong? And they're getting hammered on the comment section, and you were at that point where you're like, "I know it's gone tits up, but just tell me where you are and, and what's happening, rather than silence." And you know, establish companies with successful uh, campaigns under their belt, get it wrong, and don't communicate with people. So, like, you, it sounds so simple that we all laugh, but like, a lot of people won't won't front up and say, "You know what." Uh, our Chinese manufacturer haven't got back to us and we don't know when they're going to. In our case, we have everything's manufactured in the UK. But when we have had things haven't worked out, we tell people because people would rather know. Yeah. It's always best to say, hey, you know what, guys, we, we did a small cut this model and it just turned out like absolute dog shit. So we went back to the drawing board. And most people. Yeah, we might flower the language up over that. Well, we, we, we're actually looking at, so one of the things that came across from, um, and in fact, we, we, we posted this out in the comments section, actually. A lot of people were sort of saying they like, they kind of like the initial sort of the concept of the, the Kodiak Walker from UNM, that the Kodiak Tactical Heavy, Heavy Bro. But a few people were sort of suggesting that we could maybe make the sculpt a little bit more dynamic. Um, and so, rather than us just saying, well, look, this is the, we've already sculpted it, this is what you're getting. Um, we thought, well, actually, what, well, why can't we do this at school? Is there any reason why we couldn't? Well, yeah, okay, this is, you know, it's going to cost a little bit of extra money, so maybe I'm going to look at that. But if this is, this is the feedback that we're getting, it would be remiss of us to not listen to that feedback. Because this is coming from the people that have given us their hard earned money and want to see the skate succeed. So, you know, you, you, you do well to listen to those people. They, they're your community. Yes, very much so. Yeah, it, I mean, that, I think that's you're you're right on that. That is one thing a lot of Kickstarters do. Is they say don't listen to the community. They keep pushing forward with their product. And somebody might say, hey, you know what, guys, that small just you know is not holding up with the rest of the product. If you've got that one guy in Kickstarter saying it, you can't just write him off. Because once you get into the mass market, it's not just going to be that one guy. It's going to be that's right. 30, 200, 300, and Suddenly you have a small that's just dead. Or you got a small that's just turning people off the game. Yeah, absolutely. It's I, I think it's not just, it isn't just Kickstarter. You know, this is, when was the last time, like, you phoned up, like, you know, a repair company, or, you know, you want to call out a plumber, or something like that, and they, you know, they don't return your calls, or, you know, you phone up your bank, and you've left on hold for an hour, like, that's not, you know, that's not good customer service. You know, it's not, nobody, nobody likes to be left waiting, and, and Kickstarter is no different. You, you have to, you have to treat it professionally and you have to treat the people pledging their money with courtesy and with decency. I think it's another, it's another thing coming back to like, you know, our age and where we are at the moment. I think if I was in my mid-twenties, I might dig my heels and say, you know, you, you know what, we put effort in, we like this sculpt, we're going to stick it, you know, screw you guys, what you know. And now we're, we're really not precious about this. I mean, it is an absolute passion project for the two of us. And, you know, someone came in and said, you know, that piece of fiction that you produced for this character was, you know, uh, to use your, your term, dog shit. Um, that would, uh, it, I mean, that, that would, it, yeah, I mean, that would, that, that, that hurt, but like, we can't, I mean, thankfully that hasn't happened with the fiction yet. I mean, I'm sure it, as the game gets bigger, it will at some point, but, um, we're not, we're not saying, oh, you're wrong. Uh, you know, when people give us constructive feedback, we're like, well, you know, We've done that to other people, you know, we, we've given constructive feedback to, to campaigns that we've backed, and we're not douchebags, we've done it because, you know, we cared about it, we've got money, and we're saying, oh, you know, I think we're getting better if you do this, and, you know, the backers are I mean, actually amazing, I mean, it sounds a bit cheesy saying so, but, you know, I've never been in a position where people have paid for something I've produced, and it's genuinely humbling reading comments from people who are, you know, you, you've got your kind of super backers who are always on the forum answering each other's questions on your behalf. And, like, those guys are just awesome. I mean, they've, they've backed your projects. They've put money where their mouth is. They're really into the game. And, you know, we're going to engage with them as much as possible. Um, well, what because we, what it, it's a hugely wasted opportunity if we don't. Sure. What, we, what we've actually had is quite interesting. There's, there's a, quite a large percentage. In fact, I need to work out exactly what percentage, but 
quite a large percentage of the people that uh, not only is this their first Kickstarter, but this is their first miniature game. And that has absolutely blown us away. Um, that, that people are, are, you know, so intrigued by this game, by the experience of this game, that this is going to be their entry into the miniature gaming world. Like, that's... Like, I'm not sure. I'm not sure we're ready to handle that responsibility. Well, yeah, it's too close. Yeah. yeah. But, that, I mean, but it's amazing. Like, that's... And again, like, you know, the world is humbling. Like, it, it is really humbling. You know, I've, I've had, you know, 15 years of working in the video games industry where I've put my product out there, but it's been a product made by, you know, a few hundred people worldwide. This is a product made by, you know, 10, 12 people. Um, it's, it's very different. I and mean, it feels very personal. And to kind of, to get that feedback is just, yeah, it's, it's incredible. It's what keeps you doing it. You guys, I hate to cut this short because I could go on and on and on with you guys for hours on end. It's been nothing but awesome talking to you guys. I'm sure we'll keep this conversation going offline. However, I want to give you guys the next couple minutes to go ahead and plug your Kickstarter a little bit more. Give some people a little bit of an idea of what they should expect. It's three days to go. It's already funded. But, damn it, I want to see more people playing this game. <laughs> I mean, cheers, but it's been a great chat. So, I mean, I don't know what we have covered that effectively. Give it a go. You know, we've, we've made the rules completely free to, free. Uh, they will always be free to download on our website. You know, we're massive awesome. The game is Shattered Earth. You can Google it, find it. You know, you don't need us to spell out exact URLs. Um, the, we've published. Uh, you know, you can see photos of the actual miniatures we've made. You know, we've done a full production run on most of the mini, so you can you can just see what the product will look like. You can play the game. I mean, we're still in, uh, you know, alpha rule set at the moment, and it will continue undergoing playtesting. Um, and then we've put out some fiction. You know, we've put out probably one or two long pieces. We'll probably put a couple more out before the end of the campaign. Uh, we've got a bunch of short kind of intro pieces, so you can see the style of our writing, the kind of the scale of the game that we're going for. And um, if you have questions, you can look on there and see. You know, we've answered. I mean, as you say, there's only two of us, but we've tried to answer every single question. When people said it'd be nice to hear a bit about this, a bit about that, we've got back to them. So, you know, I guess have a look. You know, if you like the look of the art, if you like sound of fiction, if you've got questions. It's almost certain that within a couple of days, one of us will get back to you. Because, uh, you know, we're just, we're just uh, grateful for, you know, this small community building up. And we figure there's no there's no way of cheating this. There's no quick way. What our plan is, is deliver, you know, great minis, great rule set, you know, a really interesting backstory. And if they all are good, people will want to play the game and the game will grow. You know, we're not going to try and a hard sell or, you know, special offers, hard price or anything. We're just going to say, here's our products. Hopefully people will like it. And if people like it, they'll buy it. But, you know, they'll tell their friends that it'll grow organically. You know, Cyan will be able to continue turning this hobby into a job, hire our guys instead of, you know, having it on contract form. And, you know, we're in it for long term. We want to be talking to you guys in, in 10 years and seeing you at a, you know, a depth department Gen Con with our, you know, our, you know, rule set version 3 or version 4, whatever that is. That's, that's our aim. So, Si, anything else you want to add in there, man? All I, all I would say is we've got, we've got three days left. Um, if you are on the fence, there is a one pound pledge level you can back at. And a few, uh, last week we unlocked uh, the softback mini rule book, um, which is available with all pledges. So literally, you can go ahead and pledge a pound and you get a rule book. And then, you know, you, you make your choice there. You, you know, you, you're not willing to you know, there's a lot of Kickstarters out there at the moment. If you're not willing to, to maybe you know step over the line and pledge your money towards, that's cool. But we want you to be part of our community anyway, because this is a as, you know, as John has said, and as I've said countless times tonight, you know, we, this is an awesome community that we've got. We want everybody to be a part of it and just help us grow this game. So please, you know, just just jump on board. Awesome, awesome. Well, guys, thanks for so much for coming on. Uh, I really appreciate it. You're very well. It's, it's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, and I've been really enjoying the show. I can say I've got too many podcasts to listen to, but I'm just you just bumped like I don't know the Kano film show off my weekly list because I know I have to listen to a couple hours of you guys every week, which is <laughs> good, I think. But uh, yeah, well done on the show. Yeah, I mean, what four or five days.
already essentialist discouragement. So for everybody out there listening, again, go to kickstarter.com, check out Shattered Earth by Massive Awesome. Three days left. Back it, play it, enjoy it. Guys, it was great having me on. Talk to you later. Absolute pleasure, guys. Thanks a lot. Thank you.